Um, the first speaker we have today is Austin Zuggi. He's a shareholder here at Kenny and Lang, and he's going to be presenting on uh, the patent troll debate, which has been a pretty hot current event here as of late. So um, without further ado, I'll welcome Austin up here to the stage. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I know it's an early start today, and uh, as Ryan mentioned, the facility doesn't allow coffee in here, so I will certainly uh, not be offended if I see anyone dozing off. <laughs> but this morning, I'd like to talk about the patent troll debate. And this is a topic you've uh, maybe seen at, at other CLEs. And what I'd like to do, uh, it's maybe a little bit different, is provide a little bit of historical context uh, for this discussion. Uh, there's a lot of efforts underway now to reform patent law in some way in an attempt to curtail patent trolls. And uh, a little bit of historical context might help us understand a little better uh, whether these problems are in fact new and whether any of these uh, reform proposals uh, will address those problems uh, in any way that's, that's different than what's been attempted in the past. So let's begin by talking a little bit about what are patent trolls and who are they. In fact, they're not really a new phenomenon. The term patent troll has been around only for about the last 15 years. It was coined by an attorney at Intel uh, who used it instead of the term patent extortionists um, because he was getting sued for libel for that term. But going back over 100 years, uh, the term patent sharks was used to describe more or less uh, the same type of entities. And today, one of the challenges is really understanding who is and who isn't a patent troll because there's no universally accepted definition. Uh, there's some other euphemisms uh, people have, uh, including non-practicing entity and patent monetization entity. Uh, these refer to patent holders who have a patent but aren't manufacturing or commercializing it. Uh, uh, the latter, uh, patent monetization entity, referring to someone who's going a step further and uh, trying to extract license fees uh, from, from those pat types of patents. But the thing about those terms is that uh, the patent laws permit those things. Uh, the United States has no working requirement. There's no requirement that a patent be practiced, uh, which is a difference from some other countries which have certain regulations in that, that respect. Now, in terms of some definitions that have been offered, uh, Peter Detkin, uh, the attorney from Intel who came up with the term, really used it in the sense of referring to non-practicing entities. And what's a little bit funny about that is uh, he came up the, with the term while at Intel, uh, but in subsequent years he co-founded a company by the name of Intellectual Ventures, which buys up patents that they do not practice and enforces them. So uh, with a fair amount of irony, he uh, has uh, taken the approach of if you can't beat them, join them. The now former chief judge of the Federal Circuit, uh, the exclusive court for patent appeals, has offered a number of definitions. His, his all revolve around someone enforcing a patent for more than what uh, the inventive contribution uh, was, or using patent litigation uh, as a cudgel uh, rather than uh, bringing an action on the basis of the value of that patent. What's a little bit tricky about those definitions is you never really know what the value of a patent is until the end of the trial. So it's a bit hard to throw those terms around on that basis uh, until you've gotten to the end of a trial. Dennis Crouch is a law professor. Uh, he's offered a definition that's pretty interesting in the sense that he focuses on how Patent trolls are entities who don't commercialize their invention and act as sort of a free rider. Uh, they wait until others commercialize and build up a market for an invention, and then uh, late in the term of a patent, 
uh, try to uh, extract license fees or, or bring an infringement action. The uh, last example I have up on the screen is uh, from an attorney who has a blog and uh, kind of the cynical approach here is uh, that a patent troll is just any plaintiff that a defendant doesn't like. And uh, in litigation, uh, when you've been sued, uh, you usually don't like any plaintiff. Uh, so uh, in his view, the term patent troll really has no, no definite uh, substance to it. Uh, it's just a pejorative term thrown around uh, when defendants uh, assert that they must be right. But as we look through uh, these definitions, a lot of what the debate comes down to is a, a policy debate over who should capture the benefit uh, of invention. Should it be the inventor uh, who captures all the downstream benefits, or should uh, those who commercialize inventions implement them, should they capture a substantial portion of that, uh, uh, the money involved uh, that flows from those inventions? So just kind of expanding on that point, uh, I have a very simplified diagram here on, on the screen, uh, which is just meant to illustrate uh, these underlying uh, policy concerns. So if you want to look at economic power, what it often boils down to is having, in effect, monopoly rights or some ability to disrupt uh, interrelated aspects of, of the overall economy. So among those would be commercial advantages, perhaps things like horizontal or vertical integration within an industry. Uh, you've also got IP patent rights, uh, another type. Uh, the government has a monopoly over implementing regulations and uh, imposing taxes. You've also got labor who can go on strike. And often when you kind of look past the uh, often self-serving claims uh, uh, over uh, patent reform and, and curbing the excesses of patent trolls, what you see is parties that have commercial advantages don't like someone with uh, a patent monopoly eating into uh, the profits they think should flow from their commercial advantages. Uh, so. Uh, that's, that's one way of looking at this. Um, I kind of get this idea from uh, Simon Patton, who was the chair of the economics department at the Wharton School of Business long, long ago. And he said that uh, reducing or freeing up revenue from one monopoly just makes it available to be captured by another. So uh, when we look at this issue, oftentimes we're seeing businesses that don't have a substantial patent portfolio complaining that you know, their advantages are being eroded by those who hold patents. Now granted, these are not necessarily all independent spheres and certainly uh, entities could have uh, advantages in many of these different areas. Uh, but uh, it's sort of a useful way of, of kind of looking past some of the self-serving rhetoric you sometimes hear uh, talking about uh, reform efforts. And within this context, uh, going back to Dennis Crouch's comments, uh, one thing that's, that's useful to note is many patent trolls are seen as waiting until uh, a certain technology has been widely adopted and sort of late, uh, late in, in that uh, stage uh, bringing uh, an enforcement action or seeking licenses. And from a commercial standpoint, someone adopting technology that's already been uh, prevalent uh, in the marketplace takes very little risk in doing that. And so there's often uh, a debate here about how patents should be valued, uh, how should damages be assessed, and should there be uh, an ability for the patent owner to extract higher fees at, at that later stage when uh, late adopters take very little risk in, in uh, copying a patented invention. So I've got a list on the screen now of 
famous alleged uh, patent trolls uh, from history. Uh, you've maybe seen uh, or heard of, of all these names, uh, or at least some of them. Eli Whitney, I remember hearing about him in history class in grade school or high school, uh, often described as one of the great inventors uh, in American history. Uh, he invented the cotton gin, which uh, separated seeds from cotton and uh, really allowed the United States to have uh, a substantial cotton industry uh, based on the type of cotton that actually grew in our climate. Uh, and he had a patent on his cotton gin. And as a manufacturer, he tried to build cotton gins and sell them, uh, but he basically failed as a manufacturer. So in response, he went around uh, starting uh, patent enforcement actions. He really made no money in the process. He was consumed by the legal fees and became an arms manufacturer instead. Uh, but nonetheless, he was an early example from the earliest days uh, uh, of the US patent system, um, engaged in the sort of conduct that we're talking about today with, with patent trolls. Uh, some other examples on here, Thomas Sales, he uh, was uh, someone who bought up uh, three patents on double-acting brakes for railroads in the uh, latter half of the 19th century. Um, and he asserted that those three patents covered any possible way of implementing double-acting brakes uh, on a railroad car. Uh, Thomas Edison, even, in uh, Charles Goodyear, uh, uh, names that we still know today uh, also have been uh, described as being patent sharks or patent trolls. Elias Howe uh, was involved in what they called the sewing machine wars. He had a patent on lock stitch mechanisms for, for sewing machines. George Selden, I'm going to talk about him a little bit more in a second. Uh, he claimed to have a patent that covered any gasoline automobile. Jerome Lemelson, uh, he's a little bit more of a modern figure. Uh, to some, he's a hero and a champion of independent invention. To others, he was a patent troll who uh, tried to suppress uh, barcode scanning technology and some other uh, things using uh, what used to be called submarine patents. And Bob Kearns, who invented the intermittent windshield wiper mechanism. Uh, I've got a little image here from a movie that was made about him a few years ago, uh, starring Greg Kinnear. Uh, and what you see with a lot of these names is a pervasive theme of sort of the independent inventor versus an established industry, or sort of a David versus Goliath uh, 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 scenario. Now, I mentioned George Selden. Back before the internet, uh, for those of us who remember, uh, you used to have to publish notices in the newspaper or in a magazine. And Selden would publish a notice saying that his patent controls broadly all gasoline automobiles which are accepted as commercially practical. So he demanded that every automobile manufacturer in the country pay him a fee to, uh, to build automobiles. And actually, most uh, acquiesced to that demand. Uh, he obtained a lot of uh, licensing fees, um, except Henry Ford refused to take a license and, and fought the Selden patent. So he had his own notice here uh, where his attorneys say that the Selden patent is not broad, and if it was, it's anticipated. This is familiar if you've ever encountered uh, a patent troll. This is, this is the template for, for all patent troll disputes. So Henry Ford had to go to court uh, to, uh, to challenge uh, these infringement claims. And in the end, the court said that Mr. Selden did have a valid patent, but it was narrower than was being asserted, and Henry Ford was not infringing. So the patent itself uh, recited a hydrocarbon gas engine of the compression type. And what the court said is that covers only Mr. Selden's uh, modification of the so-called Brayton engine, which is more or less a precursor to today's uh, diesel engines uh, that don't use a spark plug. Instead, Henry Ford's cars were using an auto engine, which is a four-stroke engine that uses a spark plug. Now, 
patent troll demands can go to the extreme, and I, I just had to mention this, this example. This is from about 100 years ago. A patent owner uh, was making a demand that there was infringement by GE, and he sent a letter to one of their top engineers uh, and also to the chairman of the board. And in the course of uh, accusing them of patent infringement, he casually mentions it only costs $1,000 to get somebody killed in this country, and he had the $1,000. And in case you're wondering, uh, you know, today's value of that dollar, that's about $15,000. So patent trolls uh, not only make uh, demands for money, but uh, they can go as far as to say your money or your life. Now, some of the commonalities of uh, patent troll issues is that they often have what are called umbrella patents, or at least they used to be called umbrella patents. These are ones that are vague or abstract in such a way that the owner claims they cover an entire industry. They preempt all activity in a given industry. In recent times, this is seen most often with patent claims that make trivial recitations of uh, use of a computer or uh, being conducted on the internet. Uh, it also frequently involves what we call functional or results-based claiming. Uh, this is where a patent is drafted so that it doesn't specifically identify the particular embodiments that the inventor has devised, but uh, try to protect a, a result with, without limiting uh, the coverage to any particular implementation. They also use extensive continuation practice. What this means is uh, obtaining multiple uh, patents, or at least filing multiple patent applications to uh, be able to define the invention after perhaps others have entered the market um, and have commercialized similar inventions. You also have what I've called here like a Gresham's dynamic uh, for patent examination. Uh, Gresham's law, uh, so-called, is, is from economics, uh, and uh, it's usually phrased as bad money drives out good. Uh, comes from this idea that back when uh, coins were made out of precious metals, uh, some would have less metal in them, or metal would be shaved off. Because they have the same face value, uh, you sort of got an advantage by using a coin that, that had less metal in it. So uh, the bad ones drove out the good. Uh, same with patents here. Uh, with all the thousands and thousands of patent applications that the patent office deals with every year, uh, there's a tendency for those few that are uh, allowed by mistake to sort of dominate the patent in, uh, enforcement arena. So th that happens a little bit here, too. You also have extortionate licensing demands based on cost of uh, patent litigation, not really on uh, the value of the invention, whatever that is. Uh, you also see a lot of use of shell companies, uh, both to obscure who really owns the patent, but also uh, in an effort to uh, have jurisdiction in particular venues uh, for litigation. And uh, on that point, uh, there are certain district courts around the country that operate using very different procedural standards than, than the rest of the district courts. And these are often very favorable to uh, patent owners who bring enforcement actions. So again, we have sort of the Gresham's dynamic here where uh, no matter how well uh, district courts generally uh, handle patent trolls, if there's a few courts who uh, are, are more lenient, all the litigation is driven uh, to those venues. To give a little bit more context for that, there's one judge in the Eastern District of Texas, uh, Judge Gilstrap, uh, and in 2013, he had 941 patent cases. Uh, around the country, the next closest uh, judges were two in the District of Delaware, and they each had uh, under 400 cases each. So uh, Eastern District of Texas uh, has twice as many cases uh, uh, with that judge as any other judge in the country. So turning to sort of the specifics of, of the present-day context, um, what we'll see here is that 
there's been a trend to more software and business method patents, however you want to define those categories. Uh, and a lot of the so-called patent troll litigation has focused on patents of, of that nature. So there is some uh, differentiation between types of industries. This is focused in some respects uh, on uh, particular areas uh, of technology. So I have some graphs here that come from a Government Accountability Office report from uh, late last year. And what you see on the screen now is a graph uh, showing uh, software patents uh, that have issued in relation to uh, other types, all other types of patents. And according to this graph, and, and again, maybe some dispute as to how you classify something as a software patent, but uh, nonetheless, this graph shows that software patents exceeded all other types of patents combined uh, as of 2011. What we also see is that patent litigation is on the increase. Uh, the trend in recent years has been to go up, and while this graph only extends through 2011, the number as of 2013 was uh, more or less a uh, A spike here, uh, straight up, uh, and the total was over 6,000 uh, patent cases in 2013. Some of that is driven by a change in the law. Uh, the America Invents Act, or the AIA, uh, required plaintiffs to bring separate lawsuits against defendants rather than joining them all together uh, on the basis of infringement of the same patent. So that did drive some of, some of this uh, in recent years, but it's still uh, uh, showing in, in the data that, that patent litigation is increasing. This slide, this graph, uh, maybe has too limited of a data set to draw that many conclusions, but it tends to show that software patents are, are perhaps uh, exceeding other types of patent uh, litigation. This next uh, set of graphs may be a little bit hard to see uh, up on the screen, um, but I, I included it because uh, it's proof, if you need any, that uh, people in government do have a sense of humor because uh, one of the slices of the pie uh, is kind of a pukey brown color, um, and, and that, of course, is for patent monetization entities or, or, or uh, patent trolls. So I like to think that somebody in government had, had a sense of humor when they prepared that. Now this government report identified three key factors in patent litigation today uh, in terms of the problems uh, that it presents. One was unclear and overly broad patents. Another was the potential for disproportionately large damage awards. And really, if you look at the report closely, uh, they don't talk specifically about the damage awards as much as how that drives uh, high cost of defense uh, in litigation. Uh, lastly, uh, they talked about an increasing recognition that patents are a valuable asset. 